Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to this, the sixth panel in the Lincoln League series of 2019. Tonight promises to be a particularly interesting and topical one. So, as I have said, my name is Nicholas Lear, and I'll be the chair for this evening's panel. Having spoken myself alongside Sir Bill Cash and Dr Jodie Laporte from Lincoln last year on the question of will our children thank us for Brexit, I'm especially interested to hear what this year's panel will have to say. So allow me to introduce the panellists for this evening's discussion. Firstly, we welcome Dr Jan Pavasnika, who is a Career Development Fellow in Economics at Lincoln and the Department of Economics here in Oxford. His research interests are primarily in macroeconomics, specialising in the quantitative analysis of optimal fiscal policy with heterogeneous agents and incomplete markets, whatever that is. <laughs> Jan obtained his PhD from Cambridge University and has previously worked as a teaching fellow at the University of Cambridge and as a research assistant at the Institute of Democracy and Economic Affairs. Next, we'll be hearing from Lincoln alumni, Dr. Danny Kruger, who received a DPhil in history from Lincoln College in the year 2000. Dr. Kruger is an expert advisor for the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. He is the founder and former chief executive of two charities, Only Connect, a criminal justice project, and the West London Zone for Children and Young People, a place-based early intervention project. Danny was previously a senior fellow at the Legarsum Institute Think Tank in London, Director of Studies at the Centre of Policy Studies, Chief Leader Writer at the Daily Telegraph, and Special Advisor to David Cameron in the Leader of the Opposition role. So he's no stranger to politics. Finally, last but by no means least, we welcome MCR student Asher berkowitz werner who is reading for an MPhil in Economics. His research focuses on evaluations of public policy in the broad sense of the term. Before studying at Oxford, Asher led Manchester University's Challenging Orthodoxy Society during his undergraduate studies. In this capacity, he organised a variety of panel events, including keynote speakers such as UK hip hop artist Akala and the former head of the Government Economic Service, Vicky Price. Each of the speakers tonight will give short presentations that will be kept tightly within the 15 minute allowance after which the panellists will have the opportunity to briefly respond to each other's discussions and then we will open up to a broad discussion with the audience. So without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome you, Dr. Jan Kovasnika, who will join me in welcoming him to the lecture. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas, for uh, introducing me. So as was mentioned, I don't do research on Brexit. I'm just a macroeconomist, but as pretty much any economist living in the UK, I'm very keen and interested in Brexit. So when I was offered the opportunity to share some of my opinions and comments on the possible economic benefits, I, I was quite delighted to accept. So the outline of my talk, well, if this actually worked. <laughs> is it, okay, this is the arrows. I just want to press it. Arrow. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I'm pressing the arrow down. Or is this from the right? No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Okay, sure, broke my phone last I guess. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the outline of my talk. So, so first of all, as a macroeconomist, I could not resist but talk a little bit about the big picture impact of price on the economy. By that, I mainly mean GDP. And after that, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some potential, more particular benefits of Brexit. Now, Brexit has many potential costs and benefits, and I think that we need to consider it jointly. I don't think it's very useful to just look at a random selection of benefits you know, with an event which has such a huge impact on the economy. Now, why GDP? Well, the impact on GDP is, of course, a very imperfect measure of what helps the economy, but it is a useful measure. Yeah. Why is it useful? Primarily because resources are limited. You know, despite what Boris Johnson seems to think, we can't eat a cake and have it at the same time. Now, we can roughly think of GDP as the size of the cake to be divided between the population. And higher GDP means more resources, tax revenues, and other things equal, higher achievable social welfare. Now, the bad news is that the overwhelming majority of economists agree that Brexit has already lowered GDP relative to staying in the, in the EU, and it will lead to persistently lower GDP in the future. For example, Bank of England, IMF, OECD, uh, but of course there are, some, there are some exceptions. Now, what are the main causes of the negative impact? Chiefly, it's uncertainty, which has a huge negative impact on, on business investment in particular. Then it's the lower degree of openness in terms of trade and immigration which has been empirically shown to lead to lower productivity, which then affects GDP negatively in the long run, above and over the impact of 
uh, of the short-term reduction in, uh, in available labor supply. Now, we have no idea what's going to happen. Less than six weeks before the current Brexit date, Goldman Sachs actually puts the chance of some deal being achieved at 50%, no deal 15%, and no Brexit at all at 35%. So it's a huge range of outcomes. So when we talk about Brexit, we really need to consider all sorts of different scenarios. Uh, Bank of England recently published a detailed analysis of various Brexit scenarios, and for a variety of reasons, I think it's the best one which is available. And I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A. And I'm going to use that as the, as the baseline of my, of my talk. So the, so the Bank of England has considered four different scenarios. There can either be a deal and followed by a close economic partnership or a less close economic partnership, or there can be a no-deal Brexit, which can be either disruptive and, or, or disorderly. And the Bank of England then calculated the, the impact on GDP relative to the pre-referendum forecast. Uh, well, first of all, Brexit already had a negative impact on GDP, which was 1% lower relative to the pre-referendum forecast. That's according to Bank of England forecast. It could actually be worse. The UBS think it's 2.1%. Uh, IMF thinks uh, it's 1.7%. And I'm, again, more than happy to go into more details in the Q&A. Uh, the main reason for the discrepancy seems to be that the world economy as a whole did a lot better after the Brexit vote than we previously expected, which created a huge positive demand shock for the, for the UK economy. Uh, so really, if the Brexit did not happen, we probably would have done even, even better. Okay, so what's the impact on GDP according to Bank of Canada? Well, if there is a deal, then five years after Brexit, the impact is expected to be between minus 1.75 to minus 3.75% of GDP. If there is no deal, the negative impact is quite severe. Minus 7.75 to minus 3.5 percentage points. Uh, the effect on unemployment and inflation actually seems to be fairly negligible if there is a deal, but if there is no deal, and again, there is a non-negligible chance of that, then the Bank of England uh, predicts quite a huge spike in unemployment. Uh, in the disorder scenario, up to 1.3 million people could lose job over the next uh, two years at the Bank of England. Now, that was the short-term impact of Brexit over the next five years. What about the long-term long impact? So, so this plot summarizes a range of predictions of the economic impact of Brexit on GDP by 2030. Uh, well, unfortunately, even over the long run, once we get over the transition cost, it seems that pretty much everybody thinks that Brexit will harm the GDP quite significantly in the long run. The only exception is economists for free trade. Uh, however, they make some very extreme assumptions, and it's a complete outlier. It's not real economics; it's science fiction. And again, I'm very happy. <laughs> I'm very happy to talk about that in the Q&A. So, really, it looks like it's not good news when we when we look at the big picture, at least as measured by the GDP. Now, having talked about that, let's look at what the positive benefits of Brexit are. Okay. So, first of all, it's the famous Brexit dividend, <laughs> right? So, the idea is that currently the UK sends a lot of money to the EU. EU. After Brexit, it will not send the money to the EU and it can use the money on domestic priorities. Sounds pretty simple. Well, it's not that simple. And by the way, why do I talk about it? It's not just what was said before the referendum. Actually, in June 2018, Theresa May announced a 20 billion, year, 20 billion pounds a year additional funding for NHS by 2023. And she said that it will be partly funded by a Brexit dividend. Okay, so it's not just what the Leave campaign said before the referendum. It's, it actually seems to be the policy of the government today to claim there is a Brexit dividend. Now, the UK contribution to EU is 19 billion a year. So that so far looks pretty good. However, the net contribution is only 8 billion. Once we, once we subtract things like uh, farm subsidies or research funding for the UK and the, and the British rebate, it seems that the Brexit dividend is actually only about 8, billions, 8 billion pounds. Still a sizable chunk of money. However, once we take into consideration the impact of GDP and the associated negative impact on tax revenues, we, we get a pretty big picture. So if the Bank of England scenarios are correct, well then tax revenues will be lower by about 22 billion to 78 billion a year by 2023. Well, so the Brexit dividend really seems to be about 70 billion to minus 14 billion a year. Uh, in, in bus units, it will be about minus 1.5 billion to minus 422 million a week, right? So, so the Brexit dividend doesn't look great, and therefore 
I, I think that any claims that Brexit helps the economy simply by allowing higher government spending on some priorities are just absurd. It just doesn't respect the idea of government budget constraint. Okay, uh, what about trade? Well, the cost of Brexit, well, Brexit will lead to greater trade barriers with the EU, which is the <coughs> biggest <coughs> trading partner. The good news is that it seems that relatively frictionless trade in goods might be achievable. Uh, the main issue are services, which constitute about 40% of exports to the EU, and the UK has a significant surplus in services with the EU compared to the deficit in goods, which therefore implies that it's in the best interest of the UK to keep as frictionless a trade and services as possible. Unfortunately, unless the UK remains in the single market, there will be significant barriers to trade and services, potentially quite disruptive. And UK will probably not remain in the single market due to the immigration negotiating red line of the government, uh, which wants to end freedom of movement within the EU. Also, if there is uh, if the UK government does not succeed in rolling over existing trade deals, there might also be disruption of trade with the rest of the world post-Brexit. Okay, so this is a figure from The Economist uh, a few weeks ago. The main point is that only about 25% of trade deals with the rest of the world by trade value will likely be uh, rolled over by Brexit Day, which means that there is quite a huge potential for significant disruption, right? Okay, well finally the benefits of Brexit. Finally, let's look at the good news. So, after Brexit, UK can negotiate trade deals with countries outside the EU. The question is, will the new deals help the economy? Definitely yes, compared to making no new trade deals after Brexit. However, if we compare it to the new trade deals, which could be negotiated with UK state inside the EU, it's completely unclear. We just don't know. It is often argued that the UK will be more active in seeking new deals. However, it entirely depends on which parties in government. According to the latest betting odds, it looks like about 40% chance that Jeremy Corbyn might win the next election. And I don't think he's quite so keen on free trade deals as some people in the, in the Tory party. Also, many EU countries like Germany are also keen on making new trade deals. For example, EU just, uh, the, the, the EU trade deal with Japan just came into force recently. Okay, a huge issue is that the UK economy is, is quite sizable, but still it's small relative to the EU, about 15% of EU GDP which means that it's going to be lower priority for others and condition on strategic negotiation we will have a diminished negotiating power. Right, also one of the best documented empirical facts in economics is that the distance between countries lowers trade volume significantly. Well, this limits the benefits of trade deal with countries outside the EU, which are geographically further. Another piece of bad news is that trade deals take a very long time to negotiate. Uh, maybe four years plus two years implementation seems, seems to be a reasonable estimate for most trade deals. Some of them take even longer. The EU-Canada trade deal took eight years negotiation plus two years implementation. It gets even worse than that, because five years after trade deal is implemented, then only half of the long-run impact on trade volume seems to be realized, according to Bayer, right? So the benefits of new trade deals are highly uncertain, and if they exist at all, they are certain to take many years to materialize. So that's not great news. And in accordance with this, the ancient treasury in its Brexit analysis of long-term impact on the economy assumes or concludes that the expected contribution of new trade deals over the next 15 years is negligible, about 0.1% of GDP. So the benefits don't seem to be very significant. Immigration, and that's where I think are the biggest potential benefits of Brexit, actually. So the overall impact on, of EU immigration on the UK is positive. Different types of migrants have very different impact. Uh, the Migration Advisory Committee of the Home Office recently published a comprehensive review of the impact of EU migration. The conclusion was that high-skilled EU migrants help the economy very significantly, that's uncontroversial, and also the low-skilled migrants don't really help the economy as much. But also, no adverse effect on the economy was found. So it doesn't seem there's a benefit just to the economy just from preventing low-skilled migrants from the EU to come. Now, what is the argument for benefits of immigration control. Well, post-Brexit, the UK can end freedom of movement, thus control the immigration. Well, because low-skilled migrants from the EU have little impact on the economy, if you replace them, essentially, on a one-for-one -on -one basis with high-skilled migrants from elsewhere, from non-EU countries, the economy will benefit from them. Uh, that's indisputable, I, I have to agree with that. And this seems to be the approach which is currently favored by the government. However, there are also issues with this argument. Well, first of all, it's the EU itself does not prevent the UK from accepting high-skilled migrants from elsewhere. It seems to be entirely a domestic political, political issue, right? So the, the argument relies on the assumption 
that in order to increase high speed immigration from non-EU countries, we need to reduce immigration from the EU. Well, this is actually the case if voters don't care about the composition of migration, if they only care about the raw numbers. So what's the evidence on that? Well, the evidence is actually quite mixed. So this, is, uh, this comes from Migration Observatory. Uh, it's, a, it's a survey of public opinion, right? So it seems that the overwhelming majority of people either want to reduce the immigration, the total immigration a little, a lot, or just keep it the same. And very few people actually would argue for increasing immigration, right? So, so people seem to care about the overall number quite a bit. However, they also care about the composition. So these are attitudes towards professionals from India, professionals from Poland, and then unskilled laborers from Poland and unskilled laborers from India. Well, we can see that the country of origin doesn't seem to matter very much. Uh, it seems that almost nobody minds more professionals coming to the country, regardless of country of origin. It doesn't matter if it's India, it doesn't matter if it's Poland, people just don't mind high school workers very much. However, people really, really hate low school immigration from the EU and particularly from India. So we can see that about 45% uh, of the voters don't want to allow any low skilled migration from India, whereas it's about 10% for, for high skilled migrants, right? Okay. So people dislike low skilled immigrants in general, regardless of the country of origin, and tolerate high skilled migrants. So therefore, it might be politically feasible, I think, to increase the number of high skilled immigrants from non-EU countries without reducing the number of low skilled immigrants from EU. However, if people really strongly feel about the headline net migration number, and there was a lot of public attention on this issue, right? Just remember the, the Tory migration target of tens of thousands, a lot of huge amount of attention devoted to this over the last few years. Well, then Brexit can actually benefit the economy. Reducing low skilled EU migration makes the public like more high skilled migrants from elsewhere. There are other issues with this argument, such as the response of high skilled migrants to Brexit. Uh, but I think I'm a little bit low on time. So, deregulation, another source of benefit. Well, EU legislation affects the UK economy in many respects. It is possible that post-Brexit autonomy will actually allow the UK governments to improve regulation, right? mainly due to better suitable to local conditions, more free market approach than EU average. And the benefits are estimated to be about 0.7 to 1.3% of GDP in the long run by open Europe. So that's a fairly sizable chunk of GDP. Uh, what are the issues? Well, first of all, the UK already agreed to the vast majority of EU legislation before referendum. So, so it's not clear that EU legislation is that harmful to the UK economy, right? Also, the UK government is already committed to keeping much of the regulations, mainly in terms of workers' rights and environment protection. Now, and this I think is the biggest issue of all, is that UK government will have more legislative autonomy, and therefore more freedom to help the economy, but also to harm the economy. I think that if you're you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg, then you should be really worried about what Jeremy Corbyn might do to the economy. And actually, ha having his hands tied by EU regulation might actually be a good thing for you, even if you really strongly believe in Brexit. Okay, uh, more generally, the benefits of Brexit depend uh, on positive outcomes of the UK political process. Again, I think this is very, very uncertain. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, the HM Treasury assumes probably for, for these reasons, that long-term benefits of post-Brexit deregulation might be around 0.1% of GDP, which is also not very much. All right, conclusion. Well, I have to say that Brexit can help the economy in some ways. That's indisputable. However, there are significant costs. From my point of view, the main cost is lower GDP and tax revenues, the so-called negative Brexit dividend. It's not something which we expect to happen. It already happens. And pretty much every economist thinks that it will continue to happen in the future. Right. Issue is that the benefits of Brexit are contingent on good evidence-based policymaking in, in post-Brexit UK. I think that the, yeah, that this assumption is fairly optimistic, right? Because if the referendum campaign demonstrates anything, it means that facts seem to matter a lot less than, than emotion and identity politics, or at least relatively less than they used to in the past. So I'm actually quite worried about the quality of policymaking in UK in the future. But I could be wrong. I'm an economist, I'm not a political scientist. Now, independent immigration policy can help the economy potentially very significantly in the long run if the net migration figure is a real political constraint. So from my point of view, this is the potential greatest economic benefit of Brexit, the, the migration control. But that really relies on assumptions about the, the nature of political constraints. So again, I'm not really sure 
that's the case, but I think that might possibly be the biggest Brexit method. Now, finally, the long-run uncertainty is absolutely extreme, right? Huge, huge variants of possible outcomes 10, 20 years from now. Well, for that reason, it is possible that the net impact on the UK economy will actually be positive in the very long run, just due to the huge variance. Despite the negative central prediction of most economists. However, you know, the way uncertainty works, we don't just get to arbitrarily pick the positive outcomes, right? There is a certain amount of symmetry. So if there's variance, there can be really good outcomes, but there can also be real disastrous outcomes. And yeah, for this reason, Brexit can be better than we were expecting, but it can also be a lot worse. Right, I did not quite keep track of time, but I think I'm just about Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, uh, back at Lincoln after 20 years. Uh, I'm not an economist, as you heard, I'm a historian, and uh, I found that absolutely fascinating and really helpful, and uh, I'll respond to some of it uh, when we get on to the discussion. But. Um, as a non-economist, I just wanted to refer, to, and as a historian, I just wanted to refer quickly to another episode um, in our history when a uh, country left a large uh, political and trading bloc, and uh, and the many of the same arguments were made then, which was what we might call a Mexit, when America left the British Empire. And they did so in the face of a lot of predictions of economic disaster. For the, uh, for the colonies, and they did it anyway. Uh, four out of the five great cities in America had a uh, very strong uh, trade relationship with the, with the UK, and in fact, it knew that they would suffer, and predicted there was great predictions of, uh, of, of economic catastrophe in those cities, and, uh, and they decided to do it, even those cities, and, uh, and it turned out that the predictions were wrong, and as we know, America flourished. Not perhaps immediately, there was disruption. Uh, there's even more disastrous, there's more stockpiling. Uh, but it, they did it anyway. And the argument I'm making is that these considerations are not all economic. And I appreciate that we're here to discuss the economic implications of Brexit. But I do want to just raise the, uh, your sights to a wider consideration and the thought that uh, GDP is not the sole uh, consideration when making great political moves like we have. So, um, but I'm not going to get into, I'm trying, I'm gonna try not to make a big sort of for and against argument about Brexit itself. I'm sure you all, you've done that and, uh, and, and are largely sick of it. But I do want to talk a bit about the possibilities that Brexit opens for us, and uh, which includes economic ones. And I'm not going to talk about the, the, the opportunities, the upside of Brexit. You've heard some of the arguments made there. I didn't hear about being shackled to a shrinking block uh, of world trade and the opportunity to resume our peculiar historic position uh, in the world as being both uh, in but not of Europe and both local and global. I want to make the case that in fact there is a political opportunity here to reset our economic model and our social model, which is what I, why I think most people voted, uh, the, you know, the small majority that voted for Brexit did so. What I think we have the opportunity to do and to see is the resurgence or the, the, the reappearance of a communitarian social and political philosophy in our country, which is both historic, but also particularly suited to the moment and the challenges of our times. And what I'd like to see, and what I'd like more discussion of, is less about global Britain, though I'm all for that, and more about local Britain and how exiting the EU can open the possibility for a more decentralised, more, uh, a, more, a more local country. So I'll try and explain a bit about what I mean by that. Let me first just say a word about my own role in uh, what I do in government. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, what's called an expert advisor, so I'm not a career civil servant, I, um, I'm, but I am a civil servant, a temporary civil servant appointed to support uh, policy on civil society. So, because uh, that's, that's been my, my, my background in recent years, and thinking about how communities work and how particularly how uh, independent community action is, uh, is enabled and supported, so the work of charities, community groups, local communities and all formed. And uh, I, so that's my job, and it refers to the, to the point I want to make, which is that we have a highly centralised country, and in fact a highly centralised and homogenised political culture uh, in the UK, whereby every 
you know, and they're all, to a man and woman, in my experience, intelligent, decent people uh, who really are committed to the nation, national good and to the public service. But they are, to a man and woman, uh, uh, in agreement on, on Brexit. And um, that might suggest that Brexit was, was wrong, uh, but it might suggest that perhaps there's a problem with diversity in our political system, which is my view. And I mention it because I, was, I helped produce uh, a big government document we published last year called the Civil Society Strategy, which sets out the government's position on civil society over the next 10 years. And I, I wrote that with a little team in the department, and um, all remains, of course. Um, and, uh, and, and because of freedom of movement, we have a number of uh, European nationals in the, uh, in, in the civil service. And uh, one who I worked a lot with was a young lady from, uh, from Alsace. Um, and uh, Alsace, as you know, is, is, has been contested between France and Germany over, over the centuries. And her, in fact, her father's German, her mother is French. And she lives in London with her Italian boyfriend. And we were talking one day about, uh, about the strategy and about how to, how to support civil society in the UK. And we had a section in there that I'd, that I'd written that she was particularly concerned about because it made the point that people everywhere, but people in the UK, as we were talking about, um, are particularly, particularly attached to place and to the, to the geographical community that they grew up in or that, they, that they've moved to and that people have a strong sense of identity that's attached to their geography and that we should therefore be supporting uh, local charities and community groups and, people, and those which supported the sense of place. I, I regard it as a totally innocuous uh, observation and uh, you know, not, nothing to argue about with that, but no, um, my colleague felt very, very concerned about it, and she thought that it was the... She, I mean, she then explained about her family history, and, but, and she said, when any, everyone talk, anyone talks about place, to me, I just think of, you know, I, I, I think of war and, and uh, nationalism and, uh, and, and, and aggression. Uh, and, and she says, and none of my friends, and all my friends think the same. And we had quite a difficult time over this, and with other colleagues, and they all got quite heated. Anyway, we got through it, and we managed to find a form of words that now, now sounds like nothing, uh, which is a government <laughs> document for you, um, because of this concern in the civil service that you can't talk about place. Anyway, the good news is, my colleague notwithstanding, um, she's being a bit outvoted by politics, by the expression that the public has, which is coming through very strongly in polling and in the feedback that politicians get which is that place is increasingly important to people. And it, it, what has happened is in, in the last year or two is the government has discovered this concept of place, which feels a bit like a sort of you know, satire sometimes, because it's people in Westminster sitting and thinking, uh, you know, our policies actually impact real communities and, and geographies and you know, where people live. And you know, we've got to think about it from that point of view. But they do, and it is new, because actually Westminster has, and Whitehall particularly, has operated for generations as if all that matters is, is national GDP, like we've been hearing about, and, and individual services. So it is, it's place has, been, has, has suffered. Services have, places have. And anyway, so government has sort of re re recognised this. What we are found, finding, and my work now is focused on this how to support local community, is, is places are sticky. And I'm just going to quickly run through the, 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 the two sort of simple uh, economic arguments that have been made over the years about how to support poor places, basically. One is that you uh, disregard them. You let play, I mean, I'm going to caricature the argument here, but the idea is there's some place that's going to suffer because the economies, the industries that supported them in the old days aren't there anymore, and therefore what's needed is for people to, rec to basically kind of close down those towns, more or less, and people need to get out, and people need to move, and they need to move to the big cities where the high-tech, high-value jobs are. And, uh, and we need to boost skills, and we need to create housing in these towns, in the cities, sorry, and we need to get transport working, and we basically need to facilitate exit from, you know, your, your, your Blackpools and your Wiggins and, you know, Grimsby's and Scarborough's and these towns that, that used to support industry and don't anymore, uh, or fishing is another, another big one, so the coast is suffering. Uh, actually, what has happened is that people have not moved. Some people have, and there we have this great success story of, of social mobility for many people getting often getting to university and then going to London or Manchester or abroad and never going back to the places they came from. And uh, sadly, we have a political culture of, and, and politics full of people who've done that. That's their story. They left a place, got to London and haven't gone back, and they think that that's what success looks like. I mean, to encourage more of that. And isn't it a shame that more people can't do that? 
To which you can say, yes, it is a great shame, people can be held back. Uh, and then say so we have a problem with social mobility. But actually, when people talk about social mobility, they really mean geographic mobility. They mean moving and not returning. Uh, and that is a, and it is only a small minority of people who do that. What we found is that places are sticky. Most people, unlike most of you, I'm sure, who have come to Oxford from somewhere, I presume, uh, uh, whether you go back or not, it's real, you will find out. But most people don't leave, uh, and they don't want to leave the places they're from. And uh, we, it has not worked. The neoliberal idea that you just create more opportunities in the big cities and, and, and people will move, they don't move. They don't, they don't put economics first. They put their attachment to place first, their sense of community, their commitment to their family, their love of their town, their hope for something better to come. And I don't think that's a dishonourable position. We can condemn them for sort of sitting on benefits and not moving 100 miles to, to a job. That, 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 we can do that. But equally, we can honour their, uh, their commitment to their place. And anyway, whether we blame them or don't, that's what they're doing. So what are we going to do about it? So the second idea, the more left-wing idea, is that we move jobs to them. We say the future is high tech and high value services, it's not industry anymore, so let's somehow subsidise support um, uh, firms which offer those jobs to go to these places rather than expecting the people to come to the big cities where those jobs are now. Are now. Um, that's hard because we don't, thank God it's the EU under British influence, it doesn't support that sort of philosophy very much. There's rules against subsidies for, for uh, Businesses, but there are other opportunities now. Actually, the EU has supported lots of firms to um, different ways to uh, well, supported infrastructure projects which are intended to revive um, left behind towns, as we call them. Um, but unfortunately, that wasn't working either. What we see is that people, you create a you get a high tech firm to move to Blackburn or Wigan, and what happens is high skilled people move to Blackburn and Wigan to take the jobs. Uh, you might get an increase in productivity locally, or uh, certainly increase in jobs, but if you look at what's happened to the residents who were there before, no improvement. A few sort of jobs and new coffee shops that spring up, and new taxis and dry cleaners, and you know, a few sort of servicing the incomers, the middle class incomers. That might happen, but not the transformation that's hoped for. So neither incentivizing or requiring people to move out of these places or getting them, or getting jobs there, uh, it seems to be cutting it. I'm going to run to the end because I want to make a point about Brexit, which is that what do we need, and I think, is an is a opportunity for social renewal, for a new political uh, and economic philosophy which recognises the foundations of growth and productivity, long-term national GDP, the foundations of that is local, and it consists in people who are strong in the virtues of, of enterprise and employment and self-reliance, and what that requires is a strong civil society, coming back to why I do the job I do. It requires families and communities to be strong. We need infrastructure in places. That's why I'm so distressed about the cuts to local government spending. I'd rather have seen cuts to health or welfare and see local government boosted so that it can invest in the, in the libraries, the leisure, the culture, uh, the arts, the sports, all the forms of, of association that bring people together and give them personal skills, the sense of resilience, the commitment to each other and to a neighbourhood that actually create the strong communities that then you can have, and then that creates thriving places that people want to live and work and invest in, and you create a thriving town. It's not an economic story, it's a social one. And, uh, and what I'm hoping, and we, we are seeing indications of it, and we're working on it, um, there are you know, all these different arguments, the argument you just heard very strong in the Treasury. Uh, other bits of government, including mine, are making different arguments about how post-Brexit, there is a Brexit dividend in the sense that we're no longer going to be uh, uh, sending money to Brussels, which it then spends in the UK. I mean, there might, it might indeed be net less, but we'll have control over it. So what is the design, the shape of that funding going to be? There are some billions of pounds a year that previously the EU spent, now the UK will be spending it. We could spend it worse, we certainly could, um, but we could spend it a lot better, and I would like us to be spending it in the way I've described, investing in local, in civic infrastructure. I will end with this observation, which is that we are seeing, and uh, I don't know if the discussion will touch on this, but obviously politics in the last week has changed significantly with this new uh, group formed of Labour and, and Conservative centrists. If we are seeing three new part, three there are three now groups, well, and what we've got is a uh, potentially the emergence of the state party, a party about equality, <coughs> doing everything from the centre, but in, in a much more redistributive way. And that's that's that will. Be the evolution of the of the Corbynite Labour Party, focused on equality. You see a new uh, 
party focused on freedom, focused on individual rights uh, and opportunity, uh, which would be very internationalist, quite globalist, very, very pro-EU obviously, pro-free trade, that's this new centrist party, really focused on individual freedom uh, and internationalism. And then you have this third party, which is about society, which is about the organic connections between people in places. Uh, it's, about, it's about tradition, but it's also about diversity and pluralism. It's about the way that different places can have different shape and identity. And it's about the human relationships that make life worth living and the real foundation for economic growth. So that's the political movement that I think uh, we could see coming out of Brexit, and I hope it'll win and, uh, and, and, and govern us. That's enough. Thank you very much. The mayor of Chicago, an ex-Obama uh, era chief of staff, said that you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. This crisis, the financial crisis of 2008, provides the opportunity for us to do things that you could not do before. Now, regardless of what you think about Brexit, whether you think it's as bad as the 2008 financial crisis, you should not deny that it provides political opportunity to change things. Now imagine, just imagine, that you had the ear of a high-flying government expert advisor. And knowing that the next five or ten years of government will shape our economy, our country, in ways that no government has been able to in over a generation. What reforms would you ask for? If I were in a room filled with the next generation of world leaders, high-flying civil servants, business people and scientists who will create the technology that will shape what is possible, I don't think I'd waste that opportunity on anything other than inspiring these people with ideas on how to change our world for the better. Now, if you were in conversation with such people, you've seen that opportunity only to air grievance, for me, would be a waste of time. So there are two espoused economic benefits of leaving the European Union. First is the possibility of trade deals and lower tariffs with our trading partners throughout the world. Second is the so-called cutting of Brussels red tape, creating a fast-paced business environment where businesses can innovate, unimpeded by regulation, that can only trail behind as technology rapidly changes the society we live in. The first of these, in my eyes, is beyond the scope of this talk, which is primarily on domestic economic policy. So I shall focus on the second, which is deregulation. I shall say now that deregulation is not all bad. Consumer protections, the assurances that your products are safe to use, are good things for you and for the economy at large. But there are real costs to real people, to you and me. Now, what would you rather wear? a hospital gown or a pair of your own pyjamas. The hospital gown is an awful metaphor I've come up for EU regulation. <laughs> it's a one-size-fits-all approach to regulation. It may well not achieve its singular purpose and is liked only by a select few and no one really knows who designed it. <laughs> but that, for every one pound of cost that British regulation inflicts, it brings almost £2.50 worth of benefit, whilst EU regulation barely breaks even. There are some great areas where regulation is best made on a regional level. I think if any economist in the room knows about the tragedy of the commons or the prisoner's dilemma, where inability to cooperate causes everyone to be worse off. And in those areas, it is, it is indeed best to cooperate on a, on a regional level. Now, fantastic opportunities for the EU to do great stuff. There are two areas, in fact, that I think are, you know, that we should all know about, um, where the actions of each individual state spill over international borders so easily that, that in, international cooperation must be a no-brainer in these areas. Uh, there's climate change and the fish in our ocean are the two examples I should bring up. Now, good European or global regulation on these matters, I think, is celebrated by almost anyone in this room. But the current regulation really isn't good in these areas. Uh, climate change isn't even particularly difficult an area to come up with good regulation. Uh, in the mid-90s, before any of us really cared about climate change, over 2,000 economists signed an open letter calling for a simple carbon tax that could be implemented on a national level. Not interna no international cooperation needed for that. It could be done on a national level, particularly for the US. Then, uh, at the time, it was the most economists who'd ever signed a public letter. Last week, over 3,000 economists this time basically signed the same letter that called for a simple carbon tax 
that could be implemented at a national level with a border adjustment tax to maintain competitiveness of exports. This is the most economists ever signed a public letter. Um, and it's calling for basically the same stuff that we knew that we need to do over 20 years ago. The, the UK will be very, very unlikely to scrap the regulation that the EU has put for the environment because we tend to care more, actually, than the general EU does about this stuff. But outside the EU, we could institute a carbon tax and a border adjustment tax, a system that will encourage low carbon innovation. We could make the UK a world leader in the sector. The British people, I think, are definitely ready for such policy, um, and definitely for good reason. Uh, the EU could have followed such a policy. I, I would commend them if they did, but they aren't, and it's very unlikely they will anytime soon. And on our fisheries, uh, a few months ago, British trawlers legally trounced French government restrictions on mussel and clam fishing whilst uh, the French trawlers could not go out because the French law barred them from doing so. The regulation on fisheries was meant to maintain fish stocks throughout the EU, throughout the EU but in fact has really failed to do that at all. There's been many instances of mismanagement. And fish don't respect national borders. I will certainly accept that. <laughs> but Look at Norway, where they, they also have fish that don't respect their borders, and they felt much happier to have a fishery system. And they're very dependent on fish for their economy. Fish and oil, that's about it. Um, and, but, but, and they have found that you know, the, the best management practice for them to create sustainable fish, uh, fishing agriculture was not with the EU, and are actually quite rushed out regulation on fisheries. And now from that, onto areas that the EU have just been you know, pretty bad on. Um, and if your government, you see, does not change these things, I tell you, they have certainly failed you on this opportunity. Um, they've squandered the chance of a lifetime. The clinical trial directive is the first example I shall give you. Um, it's being replaced at the end of this year, probably. Um, but there's been so many years of delay, who, who even knows? And it's still not going to be perfect, this replacement. It creates hurdle after hurdle for doing life-saving medical research, blocking research into secondary uses, often on, on already proven safe medicines. They just want to find out, does it help with something else? Pretty impossible to do that, or at least it has been. Um, people's lives are certainly cut short by this. Uh, and we have a thriving biomedical sector. Many of you work within it, will work within it, and have research that contributes to it. Uh, Switzerland is one of the go-to places to conduct medical trials in Europe. They're not in the EU. Um, that's, that, that's not entirely a coincidence. Of course, they already have a knowledge base, but they've done pretty well with their regulatory environment outside. There's a good argument to say that, well, we're going to still have to export to the EU. We're going to have to do trials onto their system anyway. Yes, but we have to export to America too. Medicines aren't hard to ship across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and why don't we could just say, well, just adopt FDA requirements or just choose whoever's better. America's got a giant healthcare market, it's fantastic. Um, why don't the FDA, why don't all the American companies tell, demand that the FDA um, change this prescriptive EU thing so they follow one benchmark for everything? Why? Because it's very prescriptive. And you see America has faster innovation in these areas and, and lead a lot of the time. Um, having a more relaxed regulatory environment will help research in this area. Common agricultural policy is the other one, or, or CAP as it's called, and it's about 40% of the EU budget. Um, and on the note of whether we could have a dividend, well, we, we wouldn't have to spend that money on CAP. Um, it pays farmers lump sums, tells farmers not to make too much um, so that you don't have to pay too little for their food. That, um, and sometimes it subsidizes their costs with your money and pays farmers to manage the countryside in a, an environmentally non-damaging way. But we have mechanisms that tell producers when to produce more or less. They're called the market and they're a hell of a lot better than a few bureaucrats. There are issues of food security that it covers, but this would be better, um, this would be better managed under a government subsidised insurance system. Uh, it would be far less distortion than cap, and it would not lead to mountains of food going rotting as currently happens under the common agricultural policy. And then on the environment, if a landowner has too many trees in a field, oh sorry, you can't, you can't get money for leaving that 
as a, as a good feel of, the, of, of environment. It's just too biodiverse, too many trees, too much wildlife. Um, that seems like a policy that's not really directed at helping our environment. But, you know, well, the National Farmers Union will demand this continuation of subsidy payments, and they'll continue to deny you cheap, high-quality food from abroad, demanding high tariffs. Uh, let me give you an example of the kind of scaremongering the NFU put on. Um, does anyone here eat pre-washed salad bags? Bags of pre-washed salad, you don't have to wash them in a spinner. Yeah? They're pretty great, I like them, very convenient. Um, anyone here have food poisoning? Not, probably not from the salad bags. I can almost assure you not from the salad bags. But yeah, you have food poisoning, probably from dodgy chicken. Do um, you know about 14% of EU chickens have salmonella? 2% of American chickens have salmonella in them. Um, why is that? It's because they clean their chickens the exact same way that we clean our salads. Um, with a little bit of chlorine, which by the way, we like tell basically every developing country to put a heck of a lot of in their water to keep it clean too. Um, so they call it chlorinated chicken. I call it American innovation delivering affordable, safe food. But the NFU will convince you that this will kill you. Um, even Michael Gove, Minister for the Environment, think, thought this was unacceptable as part of a trade deal with the USA, um, with the EU, because the NFU got to him. They're probably the most powerful lobby in this country. Um, they unite opposition and government. You see them every year wearing these ridiculous lapel pins with pieces of wheat on them. Uh, they call it uh, Back British Farming Day, or what we may want to call Benefits for Landowning Class Day, because that's what it is. <laughs> and I'll, I'll basically ending on that cautionary tale. Um, we can scrap bad regulation and introduce good regulation. More comprehensive climate policy is, is I think, a great example. But only if we shout louder than the likes of the NFU. Don't let a good crisis go to waste. Scrap the common agricultural policy. Create a faster and more free environment for drug discovery. And create the most forward-thinking climate policy in the world, backed by almost every reputable economist. But only if we demand the best from our politicians. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, especially Ash at the end there. Um, I'll take the chair. Um, so we heard there about the economic considerations, the political opportunities, and the broad look to the future, particularly with regards to the environment. Um, I'd like you now to have the opportunity, if you'd like, to respond to each other's presentations. Um, if not, if you have no comments, then we can move straight on to uh, the audience questions. I'm conscious of time. Uh, I would actually like to. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I think that one of the issues with Dennis' argument, I think, is that there is an obvious, a great benefit to attracting more attention of the central government to regions, right? So I think everybody can agree that there are a lot of places that are left behind and struggle economically, and that Brexit was, in some way, a call for help. So I think that, that, that's fundamentally a good thing, attracting attention to regions. However, I don't think once we heard that call for help, it's actually going to help anyone to go through with the Brexit, because if we stay in the EU, we're just gonna have more tax revenues to spend in regions, right? just the inescapable arithmetic of the government budget constraints. You have more tax revenues, therefore you can support regions more. Uh, that's, that's, that's my only comment. Yeah. Um, very quickly, thank you, Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess the model, the model that we've had from generations, which is that the national economy, which basically means the Southeast, produces lots of money, which the government can then spend in the regions, is the problem. What we need is the regions to be productive and to be making money and to looking after themselves, not to be part of a uh, you know, great recycling of, of, of money produced in the southeast. So um, it's not about the overall volume of money, it's about how the money is produced and, and managed locally is my great question. I mean, just quickly, just, 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 just to respond and then we'll, we'll get to the question. I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to challenge any of the ads presentation, it's all very compelling. What isn't in there is the counterfactual. What would be happening? In the, with EU membership going forward. That isn't something we can predict. What the, the assumption here is that we will just carry on, that the growth trajectories of the last uh, couple of decades will continue. Actually, if you look at what's happening in the EU, things are not looking rosy there. And I think we have, when, again, you know, speaking personally, I think we have, um, we have got off a sinking ship. And we've avoided a greater catastrophe that will happen uh, in the future. Uh, and I would, uh, just also quickly said, talking a lot about the national economy there. Actually, that, that, that is all very true and valid. The problem is we're talking about 
marginal gains uh, overall, whereas in the places that I'm talking about, the effects there are very considerable. So a little bit of growth overall, a little bit of net benefit from migration overall, uh, might be a very significant uh, problem in the places I'm talking about. So that, and that's what I'm concerned for. Um, and just lastly, the, idea, the, idea, the argument that, that it would be a good thing for the UK to have its hands tied by Europe so that, you know, and bad government can't get in, uh, is I'm afraid that it's an appalling suggestion uh, that the UK needs to be sort of managed from abroad because we can't trust our own domestic politicians. And uh, actually, we need to, you know, if we're going to have a bad government, let's have one and then vote it out, not, 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 be, uh, not, 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 not be prevented from making mistakes like children. I really like to have this talk. <laughs> um, uh, about that. Uh, I specifically not really try to talk about the counterfactual. I think it's probably too late for any of us to change the mind of Theresa May and the government um, and, and change the type What we can do is we can demand from our politicians over the next five and ten years when, when you know when there'll be nego there will be negotiations on our, if if we have some kind of interim deal, there'll be a negotiation. If we Collapse out, then we'll, you know, like all sorts of stuff will happen. Um, if there's so, there's likely to be in the in beyond the next two months opportunities for civil society to actually influence the demands on, on the government. And I'm trying to more focus on that. On on let's just take as a given that we're not going to be in the EU. Well, then what kind of country do we want? What kind of economy do we want? Um, and one, one possible thing is that. Um, in economics, there's a thing called revealed preference, and it's where you take people's actions and you can make a pretty good guess as to, to what they what they actually prefer. People who live, who moved um, to Oxford to London, have a revealed preference to prefer perhaps more money to, to their family and their, their their local kin. Let's say um, people who live in the countryside who stayed there, who say who have stayed in Blackpool for years and years and years, um, probably because they're going to earn almost certainly much less money, um, have a preference for their local kin, for their people. So they are a distinct different group of people who, almost by definition, we will not meet. And we have not met. Because they have decided, they've chosen against moving away from the kin. If, I mean, you know, people, and this happens all across the world. I mean, if you have open borders, not everyone will move to America and Europe. Because they like, you know, and we'll, we will never meet them, probably, because we just never mention them as a necessity. We self sort into London and the, the rest. Unless there are any other issues. No, yeah, uh, we just like yes. to respond very shortly to the dying, uh, dying of the hands. Yeah. Right? So it doesn't apply just to UK, it applies to everyone. And there are actually very good reasons for some rules. Uh, for example, uh, rules in state aid. Right? It prevents you know, different EU governments from subsidizing their national champions in a sort of you know, race, race to the bottom which is fundamentally damaging for competition, funda fundamentally damaging for consumers. I don't think the UK has got inherently more need for having its hands tied. I just think that there are quite a few EU regulations, which I think most economists would think are beneficial in the sense of tying the hands of government. I, I don't think the UK government is worse than many other governments in the EU, such as Hungary, so, Poland. Yeah. Right. It's definitely not specific to the UK. It just prevents you from making some mistakes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, on that, I think we'd like to open up now to questions from the audience. So, if you'd like to raise your hands if you have a particular question, well, we'll go. Right. We well, all enjoyed all three presentations. Um, something that struck me about Danny and Patricia's presentation, which made me think, uh, I really enjoyed and appreciated the productiveness and the constructivity of, of the way you, you were phrasing this. And I love the quotes that you started with, you know, don't get uh, a crisis, go to waste. But I think that a lot of what is happening um, with Brexit, is people seeing the possibility. And everyone imagines whatever wants out of it. So you imagine climate change and your priorities. You imagined the local government. So everyone wants Brexit to work, to, to work in certain directions, which is fascinating. And it is um, a great, it can be an incredible and productive engine of change. I just, it strikes me that people see very different things. And I wonder how you go about this. Because I can imagine you wanting to spend all that dividends that Jan was saying that it was in minus, by the way. <laughs> but but you, know, I, you can see what I mean. You know, it seems that there is so much potential 
um, that is truly fascinating. And you were really, uh, you, you did so very eloquently in, in a certain various way. And I was really taken. But I am also conscious that I have so many other friends that see different possibilities. So I was wondering, throwing this back at you, uh, you three, if you want, how how do you how do you think this this, this immense immense pool of possibility can actually play out in the short term, in the long term. Because until we're here around the table saying like, oh, this could go, and we could solve this problem. It reminded me, you know, when we were talking about uh, this, a bit like when you are in a relationship with someone, and then you think that, well, but this, you know, I actually could get this part of my relationship better. You know, you can you see what I mean? And you can keep going off and off and off. Or perhaps you can talk with your partner and try to fix it or try to find a different way. I can see you can always, by yourself, control it and find a better, you know, think of a better position. What is difficult is that and, and getting people that have a different priority together. So it was only what you have to say. It's a long question. Who would like to put that first? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think, of course, there's a, there's a huge range of possibilities, right? And, and I think the main issue is that we need to consider many of them at the same time and then try to make some sort of, you know, putting some sort of probabilities on different outcomes and then we can make a prediction of what's going to happen. I just, I mean, of course, Brexit has a silver lining. There are many potential huge benefits. There are also many potential costs. And, yeah, I mean, I, I could also just talk for half an hour about the potential great outcomes of Brexit, right? But then I can spend another half an hour talking about the, the potential pitfalls. So I really think it's, it's important to just not focus on the particular costs and benefits, but to try to consider you know, the big picture and as many of them uh, at the same time. Also, one, one last point, a lot of people, when they talk about benefits, assume that they are unachievable within the EU. Well, so that may be true, my, I don't know, to some extent, but usually it's not quite so clear cut. Uh, yeah. mm. So economists like to say on the one hand and on the other, which is why Ronald Reagan said, God send me a one-handed economist. <laughs> so what, what, what you're talking about is, is politics, and that is what a nation should be involved in, is these disputes. And the problem we've had for a generation is that the realm of dispute, of, of, of possible action, has been very limited, and we've, got, we've had a consensus at the top in politics about, what, about, about maintaining that restriction, and therefore politics has been very limited. And a vision, you know, as I said, a vision of what our country wants to be, what kind of country we want to be, has been, hasn't been possible. We haven't been having that conversation for a generation. And now we are, and it's obviously very painful. And a lot of people are not enjoying it. And um, uh, a lot of people are saying terrible things in all directions. So, but we are, now, we are now moving into politics again. And that feels a positive thing. How, we, how will it will play out? I mean, I have faith in the, you know, native good sense and wisdom of the British people that we'll, we'll actually get to a sort of rather boring British compromise and a said steady as she goes outcome in the end, there'll be disruption. But remember what the real context of all of this is massive impact of technological change over the last two generations, which has just transformed the labour market, frozen wages for the for the majority, and therefore produced political turmoil. I mean that's the that's what that's what is really going on here. Um, and it's, therefore we're having these questions about what country, kind of country we want to be at last. And I think that is a wholly positive thing, and I welcome the radicalism of Corbyn, and I'd like to see a complementary radicalism on the right. And then we can have, through parliamentary democracy, we hope, if we can maintain it, uh, an effective, uh, you know, dialectical process that leads to, you know, the next generation being okay. Um, um, so, I, my issue here is that, um, I think, I think this is kind of what Jan talked about. Like there are some people who, who promoted, you know, could be uh, a good progressive, some economists of free trade, and that, and that was science fiction, and it is science fiction. Um, the thing is, I think we need more science fiction. Not all good science fiction, not all science fiction predicting, like, you know, like, you know, these great green lands, but I think we need, I think we need now for a lot of people who are very pro remain to come in and say, okay, what do I want now? How do we come around with this compromise? Otherwise, it's just going to be, um, Brexit delivered only by the Brexit by the Brexiteers, and um, and, I, 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 and and that will just lead to further resentment. And I think if we have Brexit delivered for the country by the country, so I think we need to have these discussions. And I think we need a little bit of science fiction here and there. Again, we can have some like the end, end is nigh science, and we get you know people thinking that like you have absolutely no food on your shelves, um, and like but and and specific, specifically buying very peculiar European delicacies. 
which, which that's not, I mean, which is a little bit, you know, strange. That, I mean, that, again, that's like something of ridiculousness that some people think. But, and then, and then you have, again, the, the, the people who think that somehow we're going to suddenly change mindsets of people and become uh, Singapore, which is, you know, which is not going to happen. Um, but I think we need to have people really discuss it. And yeah, I can't ensure this happens. All I can do is I say, I really want this to happen. I can't ensure that like Corbyn won't come in and, and do all sorts of crazy stuff. But I, and I can't ensure that there's not going to be some very, like, very protectionist elements within the Conservative Party who aren't going to be able to push them on this. But all I can say is I want to start talking about this so that we're informed when our new constitution, almost our new constitution is written, the new way of shaping the country will be written and we need to be discussing it. Thank you, Professor Fabio. Did anyone ask a question? And uh, yes. Thanks for really good talks. Um, the, from listening to the talks, I wonder if I would be right to say that uh, Asher and Danny, you both fall into the position of, widely speaking, domestic policy has a much greater effect on the future of the UK than the international policy does. That, this, that the disruption from leaving the EU could be um, far outweighed in benefits from domestic policy. That domestic policy could do away with all the down stuff in GDP that's predicted. Uh, yeah, I'm not so sure on your position on this, although your comments about Jeremy Corbyn would also suggest that you believe that domestic policy could have a, a greater effect um, in the lo uh, to, um, uh, to increase GDP than Downturns predicted. I wonder if you could comment on that slightly more. So, so if I take the first of all, of course, I believe that domestic policy can, uh, can have a huge impact. One of the reasons is that, well, while people talk a lot about EU regulation and EU red tape, the UK actually has a great deal of autonomy. So, it has a great range of opportunities to, to boost domestic economy. So, so, yeah, so in, in that sense, I think domestic policy is, in some sense, perhaps more important in affecting domestic outcomes than. Than EU policy, yeah, that's. Uh, uh, I guess I think that Brexit wasn't about Brexit. Uh, people weren't voting about EU membership. They were voting about the way uh, the way the system, which includes a whole bunch of global economic circumstances, but also about how uh, players in their communities operate: government, local government, employers. They were objecting to a. Uh, to a system that was taking the soul and the heart out of the places that they live in. And, uh, and what I, why I welcome Brexit, although I buy all the arguments about sovereignty and global trade, I like all that, but I really think that the value of it, I mean, that's just my personal sort of policy. Actually, I think the value of the, the Leave vote has been that it has concentrated the minds of our nation on the people and the places left behind by globalisation, and we've got to honour them and we've got to respond to their call, that's a totally legitimate call. Uh, and so while, and, and I agree with you, there's so much that we could have done. We, you know, the Thatcher government, which did a whole bunch of good stuff, including privatisation, did a whole lot of really bad stuff, and so managing deindustrialization really badly. They had this idea, as I said, that people would just move to the successful places, and that Liverpool and Wigan and so on would just wither, and that would be okay. And they haven't. Um, excuse me, sorry. Uh, and um, so, so the, 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 we, did, we could have done a whole lot of stuff before, but we weren't. And now I hope we can. I really do think that whether it's Corbyn or the new Tory leader, we're going to see a major focus on the issues that I've raised. And that is the, that is the correct response to Brexit. Super quickly, um, they both have massive ups and downs. Like, I can imagine disastrous scenarios of domestic policy and on policy and trade policy. But so, so I mean, but just focusing on domestic because one of the things that e, that exiting the EU does is renationalises a hell of a lot of domestic policy, basically, um, and that's quite interesting and has been neglected because we've been talking about trade deals the whole time in the media. So I think. You know, yeah, we have time for one more question. I think. Yes. Right. Uh, thank you uh, for your. 15-minute uh, speech is very interesting. Um, my question is primarily directed to Danny, but I welcome responses from anyone. Um, 
and it's regarding uh, your sort of picture on movement towards a civic, civil society, which I hold to. I think uh, it's an important direction to move in. Uh, my question would be with how you aim to get there. Uh, it would seem to me that you're in stark disagreement with the economic model whereby financial concentration in certain areas and certain sectors and certain cities wants to be redistributed back to smaller areas. It seems to me that you are more inclined to try to put economic activity back into the hearts of these regions. <coughs> now, it would seem to me that that aim is fairly ridiculous given the sort of general economic movements of technological development in the world today. Uh, if we look at what's happening to inequality, what we're really seeing is a stark concentration of wealth in the hands of very small organisations, technological organisations like Google and Facebook, who are allowed to run free and with regards to tax, run free and unchecked. And really what ought to happen, and it seems to me the only reasonable solution to the economic decline of small regions is to effectively redistribute the vast amounts of money that Facebook and Google have through taxation systems and distribute that into global economies. Mm -hmm. um, and that move towards technological development is unstoppable. It's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. Areas, uh, people, how do I phrase this? Um, the loss of skill and low skilled work is only going to increase, we're only going to see more and more individuals who are effectively economically obsolete as defined by what is productive. And as that increases, there really doesn't seem to me to be any solution other than large economic unions, for example the EU, to work together to build policy that actually checks Facebook, Google and is able to then redistribute finances sufficiently. Yeah, okay. All right, so, so ignoring your last point in favour of the EU. Uh, uh, um, thank you for that. I mean, so as it happens, the department that I work for is the dig digital department and the culture department. So we look after both digital policy, but also the stuff I've been talking about, about local communities. So libraries and, you know, art centres are also under the same roof as, as Facebook and Google. It's very interesting the way that distribution of government has worked out. And, and as you can imagine, there's two halves of our department who have an interesting relationship. Um, but I think the answer is in, the, is, is in that relationship. I'm just conscious of the... I, I think there's this great uh, kind of small-c conservative cultural revival going on in the West, which, as you see it, I mean, I don't mean to be flippant, but you see it in the way that you get people wearing beards and wearing dungarees and, you know, <laughs> eating organic, slow food and, and all the rest of it. There is a search for connection and for, actually, for tradition and for the old ways. But those same people are web designers and they, they're, on, they're on their phones the whole time and they're properly connected to the global technological revolution. And I think there needs to be some sort of explicit connection. And I like the way you're talking there about we need to basically make sure that these huge tech giants are supporting local communities. And there has been, that change is happening. Mark Zuckerberg um, you know, was surprised when Trump won the election and he decided that he needed to understand, so I don't know if you know this, he went on this tour around the US, he went to every single state. Uh, you know, normally the place he flew over from coast to coast, actually went to these places and he came back and he gave a speech in which he gave the immortal line, I've discovered that community really matters to people. Uh, and he was making the observation, I was trying to make that place being important. And he has now dedicated Facebook to this proposition that it's about meaningful communities, not just about the kind of Harvard, Oxford idea of you come from anywhere, you're the elite and you're just joining the global system. Uh, and you have a kind of individual relationship with, the, with everyone else. He, he recognised that Facebook needs to be about real community and that includes geographical community. Whether they're doing it well enough is a big question and how they, how they can be taxed is where it really yeah. the, the rubber hits the road. And the challenge for us in the department is how do we introduce a tax system that doesn't just drive tech away from the UK. We, have to be the, we want to be the country that is the best place to start a digital business, to, to, to cite your global tech business. And if we just tax ahead of uh, uh, Google and Facebook, that won't happen. Um, and even if the EU does the same, does it? Well, that's the end of Europe. So uh, the, the answer is some sort of global agreement. I think the answer is a lot about culture and the values that people going into tech have. And that's a great point. Most people working for these firms are decent people who want to serve, serve the world, not to serve the shareholders.
Uh, so a cultural change will happen, and you know we could get to. We need the politicians to, to be making these arguments. I'm not giving you a policy answer, but I think culturally we're we and these kind of conversations and the sort of political movement that I'm describing, I think, is the way to get. You want these firms to think about this stuff, not just about the global cyber community, which is what they were thinking about ten years ago. They're thinking about the local, real human being. Yeah, well, just. Just one point. If, yeah, if, if you wanna, if you wanna task international giants like Google or Facebook, it's a lot easier if you do it on a uniform level. This is in a bigger block like the EU. That's just my one point. Uh, otherwise, to the Congress. Uh, what we, we have started with, like in the UK, we have experiment. We're experimenting with starting tax on where the digital services are delivered. And I think that's a, a great move. Um, uh, I, I also say that smaller countries, I mean, um, smaller countries tend to be wealthier. Um, so maybe the move to a smaller, this small system can make maybe for, for better education in these matters. Um, and I don't think we're having, we're going to have this kind of massive concentration on a few tech companies. Um, that's not going to be a lot of tax. Uh, California pretty high tax anyway, and, and the states just like they, they, it can't even stop them happening globally. But such a few num numbers of people, they might have a lot of power, but whether they'll have the wealth as well is another question. I think. Well, that, and I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking uh, our panelists.